Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to October. Welcome to World Communion Sunday and to worship here with the people of Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are so glad to be here together today. Are there people who have announcements to share with us? This is, a, this is a reminder that we have apple pies. And um, last week I said I finished physical therapy and I mentioned it to my physical therapist. You know, I'm selling apple pie. She's eyes wide open. I delivered one to her this week. Um, you do, I'm not expecting everyone here to eat up these apple pies. If you have friends, neighbors who would like an apple pie, they're all frozen and ready to go. And you can give that $20 either to me or to Karen Green. Okay, I was told I had to be the last announcement, so is there anybody else? <laughs> Going once, okay. So uh, I've had the opportunity or the blessing to, to announce the World Mission Offering multiple years, many years, and uh, it's always been a blessing. And this year we've decided as, as a group uh, that we will uh, use that offering for the work of the Pierres Ketley and Vital in the Dominican Republic. You've heard their name before. They've visited our church on several occasions. Uh, so you've, you've met them personally. We've had them stay at our house. We've worked with them probably four separate occasions on mission trips. Um, they are the saints on earth. Hand to God. They are just wonderful people. Um, Ketley went through uh, breast cancer treatment recently. And uh, through all that, she managed to finish the work of ordination. She had been a missionary for 30 years and finally decided to be ordained. And we celebrated her ordination last year. And with that, she's able to be a, a hospital chaplain at the Good Samaritan Hospital in La Romana and uh, find a new pathway in her ministry as a chaplain, as well as supporting a community center for Haitian refugee, uh, immigrants in the Dominican who are really marginalized people. They do wonderful work at community building, in education, in health provision. They work person to person, street to street, in the bates, in the hospital, everywhere you look, their hand touches. So be generous, they can use your money. We have a little video clip of having a community center and that the alliance of baptist churches with whom we serve are carrying each other's burdens through intentional hospitality inviting immigrants and dominicans to the newly built community center that we started in 2000 in 2019 it was a dream when we came uh in 2016 but the lord provided all the resources in order for us to build that community center for people who have been in the Dominican Republic in La Romana. I don't know if you remember about the old, um, it was a pantry, uh, like a place to sell the bread that Pastor Jean-Luc Fanord uh, built. So it was all abandoned. So it was now, it's a different, uh, it's a different ball game that they say that where that was the only place that was provided to us and the Lord bless us. At the center, Immigrants receive orientation as well as having their physical and spiritual needs addressed. Uh, most Haitian women, like Jenny, are street vendors. Jenny is paying her own loan for with an interest of 95%. For this reason, the center also offers loans at a low rate. This alleviates the burden of pains of such a great large interest. At the same time, spiritual needs are met as women such as Jenny participate in Bible study at the center. Furthermore, patients come to the center to physical therapy. Students attend an after-school program, music classes, and other classes where they are paid, where they pay a small fee 
to give a stipend to the teacher. The center also offers immigrant services and literacy and in Haitian Creole and Spanish. The center also gives leaders the opportunity to take part in weekly discipleship classes where they learn to actively serve the community. It was through these classes to women, Monique and Nikael, distributed food during the COVID pandemic. While distributing food, they started a church in the community center. As you can see, the center is a beehive of service and activity. Consequently, each of our lives are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, we are surprised to see God's glory each day. Okay, she's contagious, isn't she? <laughs> you can't get away from that. She mentioned the Alliance for Baptists. They are American Baptist ministry, ministers, uh, missionaries, excuse me. And uh, they are supported by the Alliance for Baptists, so we get cheers from both sides. Isn't that great? Uh, and Vital, uh, you didn't see him, but we're supporting him also. He is literally built with his own hands, three churches and schools, and now he's building another floor on this community building <laughs> and he is uh, not a young man anymore so uh, they do fantastic work i want you to give a lot okay <laughs> amen i stand here to remind you that on October the 14th in Grafton from 9 a.m. to noon, the Braver Angels, which is a, an organization devoted to encouraging civic and civil conversation between those who don't agree about political and religious moral and issues like and such, to come together and use family therapy principles, very simple ones, to learn how to listen not necessarily to change each other's mind, but learn how to listen to one another. I want to encourage you to see me after the service today, and I will write down your name, your phone, and your email so that you will get uh, the information that you need to sign up. And I'll also put your name on the list because I'll be there at that event. Thank you. I want to go quickly back to the Pierres, we received this offering for the month of October. There are five Sundays in this month, so five opportunities uh, to give. And um, I don't think the envelopes made it into this week's um, uh, um, bulletins, but we'll have those next week. You can give um, by writing a check and writing uh, WM, WMO in the memo line you can put it you can put cash into an envelope that's labeled for world mission offering and you can use the drop down tab on the uh, church website there might be some other ways, ways to give too but you have five opportunities let us worship
Today we conclude our table-centered worship series on World Communion Sunday. This day is a global celebration of a sacred ritual that helps us remember Jesus' life and ministry and connects us with our Christian ancestors and siblings across time and space. There is great joy to be found at God's table, joy in the vibrant relationships that nurture and sustain this community joy in the sharing of our gifts and resources, joy in the journey as we work towards a more just and equitable world. Let us rise in body and spirit and sing together as we proclaim joy in this space. joyful spirits as Christ followers. With them and bigger. We know that sometimes it is difficult to be joyful in life. We recognize that joy is a practice, not just a happy feeling. We open ourselves to the joy that comes with justice. We make room at this table for joy in all its Our first hymn is One Bread, One Body. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy One, around the world in all nations, the faithful have gathered for worship, and we are here among them. Around the world, as the sun rises in each successive place, your children have come to pray, speaking all language and dialects, and we are here among them. Around the world, using tortillas and pita, soda bread and sourdough, your disciples remember your body that was given to us. We join with our siblings of every tribe and nation, every language and culture to worship you, to remember your story, to celebrate our place in your body on earth. And we pray as Jesus taught, our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I have had some conversations with some of our young people in the last year, and they have talked to me about things like the war in Ukraine. And they are aware that there is trouble in our world and that people are not always caring and compassionate to each other, and they are right. But today, on World Communion Sunday, I wanted to share with children of any age who are here a different story than that of war, a story of peace and friendship and reconciliation. And so quickly, I want to tell you three stories like that, and you may already know some of these stories, but I don't think it hurts to be reminded. So, um, the first story comes from the 1830s when people in Ireland were starving. They were hungry because their main crop, the potato, had failed. And so uh, we had this thing called the Great Potato Famine. And first they were hungry, and then when they couldn't earn money uh, to pay their rent or pay their bills, they got evicted from where they lived forced out. And um, it was a very terrible time, very hard time. But over here in this country, some people who had also known what it was like to be hungry and what it was like to be forced off of their, out of their homes and their land heard about the Irish people. Those people were the Cherokee and the Choctaw, who had only maybe 10 years before that been forced to move from their homeland. And they uh, took up a collection of money. I do not know how they did this in the 1800s, but they took up a collection of money, $170, and they sent it to Ireland, to the people who were hungry. Um, that would be about $7,000 today. They sent that money and um, the Irish people did not forget this, and they built in Ireland, this is a sculpture in Ireland, uh, remembering the kindness and generosity of the Native Americans who sent them money for food in their time of need. This is called um, Kindred Spirits, I think the sculpture is. And not only did they build a sculpture about it, but in 2020, some Irish people learned that uh, the coronavirus was hitting Native American people particularly hard. So they took up a collection and sent money this direction across the ocean. I think 
that I read that they sent about $2 million. A different story, a later in time story, this is uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church in Berlin. Uh, one of the pictures in front of you is what it looked like when it was built. It was a beautiful, magnificent building. The other picture is what happened when it was bombed. It was pretty much destroyed. This is what it looked like. The, this, the larger picture is what they left. So after the war, after years of cleanup and rebuilding, they tore down that, that uh, destroyed building. And what they left was the tower um, just as a reminder of the building that had been there. And actually, people go there uh, to pray for peace now. I went there, uh, Jim and I went there in 2019. Every Friday, they have prayers for peace in this space. But um, they also rebuilt. So next to the ruined tower is the building that is now the church. Um, it's not as tall as the former tower. It's the building that looks purple um, and has an arrow pointing to it in case you can't identify which one it is. That is now the church, the main church of um, in which people worship, the rebuilt church after the war. Inside, it looks like this. And um, it is surrounded all the way around with this blue glass. The blue glass was a gift from the people of France who had been on the side of the people who bombed the church. Another gift of compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation. And this um, cloth in front of me is also a replica of the glass that was a gift from France. And this last one I told the adults um, a couple weeks ago about this one, but I'm just going to quickly uh, share it one more time. This is 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. In uh, 1963, some people put dynamite into the church building and set it off on a Sunday morning. And it damaged the building and it hurt a lot of people. And again, from across the ocean, someone heard about this and wanted to reach out with compassion and care. And so an artist um, some of the stained glass windows in that church were damaged. And so an artist in Wales said, I want to make a new stained glass window to replace um, what was damaged. And also as a sign of our love and care. And so the artist was going to do this on his own, raise the money on his own. But in the town that he lived, the, the newspaper editor found out about it and said, this should not be a gift from one person. This should be a gift for many of us. So the newspaper editor amplified the story so that uh, people could donate towards the cost of making the window and shipping it over and installing it. And um, all of that was done within two years. On World Communion Sunday, I think it is good to remember that we do sometimes take care of each other and look out for each other and forgive each other. Thanks. We celebrate our common communion table with people all over the world. Through Jesus, we are brought together, and no matter how we got there, 
believing in the host of this table makes our joy complete. Let us share our stories, our compassion, our sympathy as part of one human family that shares the love of Christ in the breaking of the bread. Hear now this scripture from the second chapter in the letter to the Philippians that was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, followed by a remembrance of what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. Imagine those early Christian Philippians gathered at a table, reading these words to one another. And remember the words of Jesus. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be de deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those dead long ago and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Sovereign. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God is willing and working at what will give the most pleasure. Do you remember the story Jesus told to, to his disciples about the two sons who were asked to work in their father's vineyard? A man had two sons and he went up to the first and said, son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, oh, I don't want to. But later on, he thought better of it. The father gave the same command to the second son and he answered, sure, glad to, but he never went. So Jesus asked, which of the two sons did the father, did what the father asked? And the disciples had said, the first. Jesus said, yes, and I tell you that crooks and outcasts are going to precede you into God's kingdom. 
John came to you showing you the right road. You turned your nose up at him, but crooks and outcasts believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. Hear, hear. Let us pray. Beloved friend, we give thanks for the breath we draw at this moment, for all that keeps us alive and lively. We are made in your image and we rejoice in that part of ourselves which hungers and thirsts for beauty, truth, and justice. We thank you for Jesus, whose incomparable life and death inspires us, gives us a model for our own living, and generates in us a joyful anticipation for things yet to be. Draw us into your own presence, closer to the companionship you intended since the foundation of the world. Lord of hope and healing, you have heard the cries of our hearts. Remind us that you will be continually with us and that we can trust you. Your love will sustain and heal us. Your mercy and grace will give us courage and strength, joy and peace. So we offer before you now our prayers for those near and dear to us. We pray for Mary, that she would return to strength and be healed. We pray for Nikki that she also would have continued healing of both body and spirit. We pray for Larry and Bob, known to many of us and definitely known to you. We pray for all of the challenges that they are facing. We rejoice in the strong love that they share. We pray for your continued presence to give them wholeness. We give thanks for the life of Paula. We give thanks for those who have shared her journey and we pray for them 
for comfort for them. We give thanks for the life of Solomon's porch, for all the lives that they touched and changed with your love. We pray for those in that community who are grieving today, who are wondering where to find you in community again. Oh God, gather us up, know these deep needs of our lives, the ones we have named and those left unspoken, and send your strong love to heal and to mend, to comfort and to challenge. In the name of Jesus, who emptied himself for our sake, we pray. Amen. According to one historian, Roman society in the first century had become the most status symbol conscious culture of the ancient world. And Philippi was the quintessential Roman colony in that regard. Named for Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great, it was a retirement community for veterans of the Roman army and a city completely saturated in social hierarchies. People displayed their status conspicuously all the time by what they wore, where they were seated, the offices they held, the property they acquired, and whether their family names were chiseled on buildings. Humility was never considered a virtue in ancient Rome. If we're going to understand this part of Paul's letter, we have to remember that. So the church in Philippi is experiencing conflict, and Paul appeals to them to be united in Christ. He knows that especially in Philippi, to give in to another person, to back down from an argument, to let another person's needs or concerns prevail over your own, that is highly countercultural. And it will not happen without intentional effort. So he reminds them that our example is not found among society's elite, but in Christ. He borrows the, the language of a first century hymn and appeals to them to have the mind of Christ, who did not grasp his divine status, who did not hold on to his power as God, but let it go for the love of the world. Paul begs them, have that same mindset. Adopt the beautiful mind of Christ. Some years ago, the movie A Beautiful Mind told the story of a Nobel Prize winner who struggled with schizophrenia. His breakdown left him unable to distinguish between what was real and what was not real. That is the struggle faced by the church at Philippi and often by many of us. We cannot distinguish between what real power is and what it is not. People often think that real power can be leveraged or earned or purchased or won by vote, but exactly the opposite is the case. Jesus reveals the true power, which is also the essence of God. Jesus reveals power and God simultaneously. Because we misunderstand power so thoroughly, 
we often read this hymn and we think that Jesus gives up power, but only temporarily. We think that God continues to hold on to all the power. What is much harder for us to conceive is that Jesus, uh, that Paul says Jesus is in the form of God. And he doesn't grasp after equality with God because that is not in the form of God. That is not in God's nature. God is love. God created a world that was very good, Genesis says, out of love. And just like Jesus, in the beginning, God self-emptied in order to make room for a creation, in order to make space where there was not God, so that the creation could be free. This is the nature of the triune God, to bow, to bend, to give and take in relationship to each other. This is the nature of the power at the center of the universe. We have to understand this letter carefully because our context is different from that at Philippi. On the one hand, our culture is definitely also status conscious. We may enjoy a sense of worthiness by the kind of transportation we use, or where we live, or what we wear, or the titles or degrees that come after our names, or the number of followers we can amass on social media, or how many likes we can get. We can be, just like the Philippians, easily self-absorbed and self-important. But on the other hand, unlike the Philippians, Humility is now considered a virtue in many circles, especially among Christians who have taken these words of Paul's to heart. And so we may try to outdo each other in being humble. It's like what happened in the ancient church during Lent. The priest threw himself down on the floor saying, God, before you I am nothing. And then the richest man in town immediately prostrated himself on the floor and said, God, before you, I am nothing. And then the town beggar threw himself down and said, God, before you, I am nothing. And then the rich man whispered to the priest, look who thinks he's nothing. Many Greek texts include a crucial word in verse 4 that doesn't appear in some English translations. The word is also. With also included, the verse reads something like this. Each of you not considering your own interest, but also the interests of each of the others. We live in a world where some of us have been socialized to look out too much for our own interests at other people's expense. But also, others of us have been trained to look out only for the interest of others at our own expense. But a truly harmonious community, a community of comfort and encouragement and consolation and strength, calls for balance, each one looking to the other's needs while also not ignoring their own. The Reverend Liz Coolidge Jenkins writes, maybe this is what self-emptying looks like. Not that we make ourselves nothing, as some English versions translate verse 7, but that we empty ourselves both of arrogance and of self-belittlement. That those of us who are tempted towards narcissism are met with loving accountability from our community, and those who are tempted to think our own needs aren't important, find joy and true fellowship with those who consider our concerns essential. Balance. Writing from prison, Paul says, make my joy complete. Adopt the beautiful mind of Christ. So what does this look like in everyday life? 
because really I want to get to the joy. Theologian William Platcher uses an illustration from the world of basketball. In basketball, he says, the players who are always asking, how am I doing? Am I getting my share of the shots at the basket? They are the ones who never reach their potential. The best players are the ones who lose themselves in an effort to be part of the game. They get caught up in the game and they forget about themselves, about how many points they scored or what they did. And isn't that the case with all of us in whatever we do when we love it? An artist becomes lost in the work. Lovers become lost in the beloved. Workers are excited about a common project or goal. You toss aside that part of yourself that is always watching how you're doing. And in that self-forgetfulness, you become most fully yourself. That's where the joy comes in. When you get caught up in doing what it is that you are doing for its own sake, not because it makes you look good to others or because you can put it on your resume, we find joy when we are being the people God created us to be. Joy breaks out as we are free to be our most authentic selves and as we allow others that same freedom. The first time I saw a whale years ago, I had no idea what I was in for. We got on the whale watch boat because it sounded like a good adventure to have with our kids. And after we had braved the wind and the waves for about an hour, the ship slowed down and then a humpback whale launched itself into the air. And I was simply awestruck. My heart sped up and much to my surprise, tears were just streaming down my face. The name for that was joy. Pure joy at witnessing a creature doing what it was created to do. This massive animal jumped out of the water and turned around in the air and splashed down. And then it did it again and again. And then it slapped the water with its mighty tail and went on its way. Being itself was enough. Some of us need to empty ourselves of arrogance and be the wonderful, ordinary humans that God created us to be. But some of us also need to empty ourselves of self-belittlement and be the wonderful, ordinary humans that God created us to be. We need to know the joy of authenticity, to delight in being ourselves and allowing everyone else that same joy. Cole Arthur Riley is a black Christian in her 30s. I find her writing to be full of wisdom and healing. She grew up in a house full of noise and laughter and joy, but she didn't feel it. Later, she would be diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And as a child, she said everyone else would be dancing, laughing in the kitchen, and she would be hanging out in a closet or the bathroom. She said it took a long time for her to realize that her, it was not that her family wanted her to be compulsively happy. It was that they wanted her close. They didn't want for her the kind of sadness that would alienate her. So she learned to come into the kitchen. She mentions Marie Kondo who said uh, to pick up a possession and if it sparks joy, then keep it. And if it doesn't, to let it go. And in her book, she says, I wonder if we were to lift up our own selves how many of us would end up throwing ourselves out along with the bread ties and the jeans that don't fit anymore? 
Writing to the Philippians, Paul was urging them to be who they already were in Christ, the people of worth who God created them to be, not the people who needed to track their status to prove it. I hear echoes of Paul in the words of Cole Arthur Riley as she writes within our culture. She says, joy, which once felt frivolous to me, has become a central virtue in my spirituality. I am convinced that if we are to survive the weight of justice and liberation, we must become people capable of delight and people who have been delighted in. She goes on, some of us go our whole lives without ever being, or rather knowing, that we are truly enjoyed by a person. We can become cynical about communal affirmation, hoping that our affirmation of self will suffice. We try to meet our self-hatred with the sound of our own voice, because this, for whatever reason, is seen as a superior strength. But I think we were made to be delighted in. And I think it takes just as much strength to believe someone else's joy about you as it does to muster it all on your own. We shouldn't need to choose self-affirmation at the expense of the affirmation of another. I think we were meant for both. Beloved ones, God is at work within us, and God delights in us. May we know this. May we revel in the freedom and joy of it. And may we delight in others as God delights in them. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is not what is listed at the end of the, in the bulletin. It is uh, for everyone born. So I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing.
You may be seated. You may be seated. The Reverend Marin Tarabasi is a United Church of Christ minister who has an amazing gift with words. And I want to share with you what she wrote this week. She said, what do I call this Sunday? When I was growing up Presbyterian in Des Moines, we called it Worldwide Communion Sunday. And then for many years, World Communion Sunday. And now it is World Narrow Sunday, World Close Communion, World Barrio, Tiny House, Dormitory, Subway Car Sunday. World Comfort the Infant by Wrapping Tight Communion. For I feel your earthquake tremors, hear the melt of your glaciers, smell fire raging in so many places, I lose my breath as I run from your floods. When I am pushed by the storms of everyone on earth, the ones of wind and the ones of war, only then can I open my hand to break the rice cake pudo or corn tortilla, pass the gluten-free wafer or naan, pour the merlot or concord grape, salabat juice, atole, coconut milk. I smell the world's sweat, trying to be careful with my elbows. All over the world, this is the table of our Lord and all are welcome here. Let us pray. Merciful God, send now your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and cup and fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest on us converting us from the powers of this passing world until we conform to the shape of the one whose food we now share. Amen. this table we remember that on the at this table we remember that on the night that he was to be betrayed Jesus took bread and broke it And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, broken to heal and to mend, to transform, to restore. Do this in memory of me.
the body of Christ broken for us. Take and remember. That same night, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is poured out for you and for many, for the poor and the privileged, for those at the margins and those in the mainstream, poured out to bring forgiveness and wholeness and lasting peace. Drink from it, all of you. The cup of Christ poured out for you and for all. Take and drink. There are baskets at intervals for your cups. I would invite you to rise as we share in the prayer after communion, which is on your screen and in your bulletin. Loving God, in deep gratitude, we give ourselves to you. May we be as living loaves kneaded and shaped by your hands. May we be as wine of the Spirit poured out that others might know joy. Peace be among us. Amen. Bye.
Friends, thank you for your participation and your presence and your joy today. I leave on vacation tomorrow. The bulletin notes that Mark Chaffin uh, will be on call for pastoral urgencies to reach Mark. Um, contact Dorothy in the office or Karen Green. Um, you might care to know that I'm going to California and I have tickets on a whale watch boat. <laughs> The table of joy requires much of us. It asks us not to rely on expecting to feel good all the time in order to do good in the world. It shows us that we can have fuller, more invigorating lives when we choose to cultivate a practice of joy by staying fully present to ourselves and one another and by staying open to the unexpected movements of spirit. May the blessings of joy you find here go with you throughout the week and move through you to others. Let God's people say amen.